recorded and I'll upload it to YouTube every day. So you will have access to the lectures after the after the class, perhaps by evening. And I'll upload it on the syllabus page. So I'll keep updating the syllabus page and I'll add what topics I'm going to be teaching every week and the video lectures corresponding to that lecture. So anyone who has not received the course information sheet, you pass it around. So I think there are still uh, 10 or 11 people who are on the wait list. And unfortunately, I don't control how many people can take the class. It's uh, decided by the class size we have. And I've asked for a larger room, but I've been unable to find a larger room for this class. Uh, so, um, so we'll have to have only 50 students in this class, unless we can find a larger room. I guess you will just have to stand. Most of the chairs are taken. Oh, there is a chair here. OK. So uh, I've been teaching this course for two years. Uh, what people say is this fairly difficult course for them. But everyone so far has enjoyed the course. So even though this is a difficult course, I can assure you that you are going to enjoy as long as you have the same love for mathematics that I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, the office hours will be every Tuesday, 11 to 12 in 464 Dries Lab. That's my office. And the course text is Nonlinear Programming by Berthikas. So technically, you don't need to have this book. Uh, if you come to my class and if you can read up most of the things that are available online. Uh, but I know from my personal experience, this is one of the best books on nonlinear programming, and it's fairly mathematical. So if you plan on making a living out of optimization algorithms, you should definitely have a copy of this book. OK, this is the book, second edition of nonlinear programming. OK, and, the, uh, and Professor Bertsikas, who is the author of this book, he is a well-known person in optimization, and he's a faculty in uh, MIT and is very well known for his prior work in optimization and stochastic uh, control. Uh, evaluation policy, there will be six homeworks. There will be 30% of the grade. There is one project, and you will have to spend a little bit of effort in that project. Uh, and there will be one final exam on December 13th, 2 to 3.45 PM. Uh, we cannot reschedule re final exam for any reason, so if you need to if you have an issue with the final exam date, you have to come to me now. Uh, so we can figure out a way to uh, accommodate your request. Uh, if you come on the final day and say that, well, I have bought the flight tickets to some exotic location in Mexico, I won't be able to accommodate your request on the final date. Uh, prerequisites, you need, to have, you need to have either grad standing in engineering or you need to have some course that has exposed you to basic ideas in linear algebra. And you should be familiar with MATLAB programming. So we won't be teaching you MATLAB programming. We'll cover linear algebra very quickly in today's class. And, uh, uh, and that's it. That's all on the background material. And then from the next class onwards, we'll be just talking about optimization. Um, Project, there are certain deadlines on September 11th. You have to choose the topic and the references that you plan on reading. Uh, on October 6th, you have to submit an executive summary. There will be one page. And then on November 10th, you have to submit the project report, which is the first draft. And then the final project will be due on December 6th, which is the last day of the class this semester. OK. Any questions so far? Yes. No, it's not. But on the first day, I have to take attendance for some reason. Um, attendance is not mandatory. Uh, the, the important thing to note is that in this particular class, I will be covering almost uh, one new algorithm every day. So there is a lot of algorithm that you need to study in this class. And there is a lot of theory. And, so, and if I'm not teaching an algorithm, I'm teaching you theory. 
right? So it's either a theory day or an algorithm day and you understand how the algorithm works, how it converges and so on. So you do have to be very familiar with linear algebra. You should be able to visualize in higher dimension spaces. Uh, you should be able to uh, understand and work with uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors and uh, differentiation of uh, functions of multiple variables and uh, inverting a matrix and and so on. So really you have to be comfortable with linear algebra. That's all I can say about this course. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Have you received this course information sheet? No? There's one more. Okay. Okay. So uh, today's lecture will be will be covering some linear algebra and uh, will introduce what is the meaning of a convex function and a convex set. Uh, those are fairly straightforward definitions, but I still would like to go through it because it's helpful to get everyone on board. Okay. So the first topic that I want to introduce is the uh, notion of linear independence of vectors. So we have x1, xn, they are vectors in Rm. Okay, and we say that x1 to xn, so this is the definition, x1 to xn are linearly dependent if and only if, so this is the definition, so a definition is always introduced with this if and only if uh, clause, so if and only if there exist alpha 1, alpha n in R such that alpha 1 x1 plus alpha n xn is equal to 0. Okay? Uh, by the way, so, uh, there exist alpha 1 to alpha 1 alpha n not all zero such that. So you can't have all alpha 1 all the way to alpha n to be equal to zero. Some of them have to be non-zero. Okay? And if some of them are non-zero, then you say that the set of vectors x1 to xn are linearly dependent. So how many of you have seen the definition before? Almost everyone. How many of you have not seen this definition before? Okay. Okay, so the idea is fairly clear. If you can take a convex, com not even a convex combination, if you can take a combination of certain vectors and add it to zero, you cannot call those set of vectors as linearly independent. They are all linearly dependent. And so if x1 to xn do not satisfy this clause, then they are linearly independent. Okay? That was the first definition. The second definition is rank of a matrix. So if A is a matrix, okay, then rank of A is equal to the number of linearly independent uh, rows or columns. Okay, so I have this matrix A, 
what would the rank of this matrix be? Who wants to take a shot at this problem? Two. Two? Who can prove that the rank of this matrix is two? Yeah. That's uh, yeah, that will take some amount of work, but that's certainly an option. Uh, is it fairly easy to see by inspection? Right? So this is a non-zero row, right? This is the second row, but this is not a multiple of the first row. Right? So this is one, two, three. So if it is one, 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 then its rank is equal to two because this is linearly independent. It cannot be formed by a linear multiplication of this particular, the first row, so therefore the rank of this matrix is 2. Now if I change the matrix A to be 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 6, right, the second row is twice the first row, right. Therefore the rank of this matrix A is equal to 1. Okay. So A is said, so if A is R M cross N, A has full rank if and only if rank of A is equal to minimum of M comma N. Okay, so that's called a full rank. So this is a full rank matrix. This is not a full rank matrix. Okay. Now, if A is in R n cross n, so it's a square matrix. Then A is invertible <coughs> if rank A is equal to N. So this is also an if and only if condition. Okay. And some of, so this is also a definition. This is a result. So this should be written as a theorem. Okay. Another definition I have is x, y in R n, x is orthogonal to y if and only if x transpose y is equal to 0. Okay, these are all fairly simple definitions that you might have studied earlier. Any questions so far? No. Okay. So let's talk about eigenvalues of A. So lambda is an eigenvalue of A which is a square matrix if A minus lambda I has rank less than or equal to N minus 1. Okay. This is same as equivalent to saying determination determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to 0. Okay. So if you find, so this is, if you look at this, uh, just look at this deter determinant of A minus lambda I as a function of lambda, it is an nth order polynomial. This is a nth order polynomial. Okay. 
So because it's an nth order polynomial, it will have n roots in what? Complex plane, right? It will have n roots in complex plane. So there will be n eigenvalues of a matrix of size n, a square matrix of size n. OK, so if you find all the roots of this polynomial, they will correspond to eigenvalues of the matrix A. OK, the seventh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh. Seventh is spectral radius. of A, rho of A is max of I lambda I. So that's called the spectral radius of a matrix. And it's a fairly well-known result that if rho A is less than 1, then xk plus 1 equals axk would converse to 0 as k goes to infinity. This is a claim. Any questions on this part? Okay, so let's talk about symmetric matrices now. So A is again a square matrix is symmetric if A equals A transpose. Right? And there is a very special class of symmetric matrices called positive definite matrix. So A is symmetric, symmetric A is said to be positive definite A greater than 0. If lambda 1, lambda n is strictly positive. How many of you have heard of the term positive definite? How many of you have not heard the term positive definite before? OK. So positive definite matrix has, will be extremely important for the purpose of this course. So you should definitely remember uh, this term throughout the course. Okay, so a, a symmetric matrix is positive definite if all its eigenvalues are strictly positive. So symmetric matrices has this property that its eigenvalues will always be real numbers. So lambda i would always be in R. Okay, so all its eigenvalues are going to be real numbers. Okay, but the thing with uh, symmetric matrix is it could have negative eigenvalues. Okay, so to give you a simple example, A equals 1, 0, 0, minus 1, it has two eigenvalues, 1 and minus 1, right? So it's a symmetric matrix, but because one of the eigenvalues is negative, you can't call it a positive definite matrix. So that matrix A is not a positive definite matrix. Okay? Now A is symmetric 
A is said to be a positive semi definite matrix, so that will be represented by A greater than or equal to 0 if lambda 1 to lambda n is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So, you have relaxed one condition which is the strict, strictly greater than 0. So, that is the condition for positive definite matrices, but for positive semi definite matrix you do not need it to be uh, greater than, strictly greater than 0, it can be equal to 0. So, if I remove this negative 1 to 0, it is a positive semi definite matrix and if I change it with some positive epsilon which is greater than 0, this becomes a positive definite matrix. Okay. Are these definitions clear so far? Okay. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention about symmetric matrices is that if uh, A is, so this is the result, A is symmetric, then there exists orthogonal. I want to phrase this sentence carefully. So, if A is symmetric, if A is symmetric, then there exists a set of orthogonal vectors. V1 to Vn such that A minus A Vi equals lambda Vi or A minus sorry A Vi is equal to lambda I Vi, A minus lambda I Vi equal to 0. Okay. That is a very nice property of uh, symmetric matrices, which is that you can always come up with. So, these vectors V1 to Vn are known as eigenvectors. Okay. So, this is lambda is eigenvalue, and if A minus lambda i multiplied by V equal to 0, V is a non zero vector, then V is known as eigenvector. Right? So, what the result is saying is that if A is a symmetric matrix, then there will always exist a set of orthogonal vectors V1 to Vn, which are eigenvectors of the symmetric matrix. Okay. So, let us try to prove this result, which is my favorite proof uh, in, the, in, in the lecture one, but not the favorite proof of my life. Uh, so, fairly easy to see. So, proof assuming distinct eigenvalues. So, what do you, what do we want to prove? So, I am assuming that lam eigenvalues are distinct. So, lambda 1 lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, these are all distinct numbers. So, there is no lambda i that is equal to lambda j. 
okay so what does it mean lambda i is not equal to lambda j for i not equal to j what is it that we want to prove here yeah so we want to prove that vi transpose vj is equal to 0 okay and what do we know for i not equal to j and we want to prove what do we know uh, we also know that ai sorry a is equal to a transpose Okay, so we know that lambda i is not equal to lambda j, we know that a is equal to a transpose and from those two things that are given, we want to prove that v i transpose v j is equal to 0. So let us uh, do the following. So we also know these two uh, equalities. Why? Because vi is an eigenvector of a. So therefore, a vi equals lambda i vi, and the same equation holds for vj. So let's multiply this expression by vj. So I have vj transpose a vi is equal to lambda i vj transpose vi, and the second uh, expression I'm going to multiply it by vi transpose so vi transpose a vj is equal to lambda j v i transpose vj so, so so now I want you guys to think what should be the next step who says they are equal Okay. What's your name? Okay. <laughs> okay. So his claim is that these two expressions are equal. How many of you can say or can can see that VJ transpose AVI is equal to VI transpose AVJ? How many of you think that this equation is not true? or you don't understand that equation, that equality there. Okay. So I have a square matrix. Okay, I multiply it by a row vector on the left and I have a column vector on the right. Do you think that this is a scalar variable, some scalar, one cross one matrix, right? So this matrix multiplied by this row vector will become a row vector and a row vector, sorry, uh, this matrix multiplied by a column vector would become a column vector and a row vector when gets multiplied by a column vector becomes a scalar quantity, right? So this is a scalar quantity, this is also a scalar quantity and this is equal to Vj transpose Avi transpose. So I'm just taking the transpose of a scalar and because it's a scalar the transpose has to be equal to the scalar itself. Right? Right? Think about it. What is one transpose? It's equal to one. There's nothing to transpose there. Right? So a scalar transpose is equal to the scalar itself and I'm just using that 
idea here, I know that I know that this will be equal to Vi transpose A transpose Vj, but I know that A transpose is equal to A because A is symmetric by assumption. So this is equal to Vi A Vi transpose A Vj. Right? So what we have proved is this expression is equal to this expression. What that means is this expression is equal to this expression. So I have lambda i vj transpose vi equals to lambda j vj transpose vi. Okay, because again vi transpose vj is same as vj transpose vi. This is also a scalar. Right? So this is scalar, this is scalar, these two are transpose of each other, this is scalar, this is scalar, so I can, and I know that this is equal, so I can write these two expressions as equal. What would that yield? That means lambda i minus lambda j, vj transpose vi is equal to zero. How many of you have understood till this step? How many of you have not understood till this step? Everyone understands until here, right? So now, I have one scalar multiplied by other scalar and the multiplication is equal to zero. What does that imply? Either this scalar is equal to zero or this scalar is equal to zero, right? Now, is this scalar equal to zero? No, because of the assumption, right? So because of the assumption, this scalar is not equal to zero, therefore this must be zero. What this implies is Vj transpose Vi is equal to zero. Which is what we wanted to prove. Okay? Now if lambda i is equal to lambda j, the problem, hap the, the problem occurs that you cannot show that this scalar is non-zero, right? Because lambda i minus lambda j is equal, is equal to zero because the two eigenvalues are equal. But what the expression says is there exists a set of orthogonal eigenvectors. So what happens is there is an entire plane which has zero eigenvector, sorry, zero eigenvalue, so every vector in that plane has zero eigenvalue. So you can always pick two orthogonal eigenvectors or two, or two orthogonal vectors on that plane so as to complete this set of orthogonal vectors, okay? So when you have, when the eigenvalues are, are equal, you can pick, you have the option of picking two orthogonal eigenvectors that are also orthogonal to all other vectors, all other eigenvectors of the matrix okay and they will all be linearly independent they will be orthogonal and they'll satisfy this expression okay so you can pick up the book uh, in linear algebra and you can look up the proof for that uh, particular clause so that will prove the complete uh, the complete uh, statement so that was my review of linear algebra and i'll now move on to Taylor series of functions. So any questions on this result? No questions? Okay. Okay, so for Taylor series, I'm going to assume that f is a function from Rn to R. 
So it's mapping a Euclidean space into a real line. Okay. So for scalar case, so if G was a function from R to R, what was Taylor series? So what is G of X plus H? Anyone remembers? Assuming that G is differentiable, assume that G is infinitely differentiable. What does Taylor series say? What does Taylor's theorem say? G X plus? G prime X H plus G double prime X H square over 2 factorial plus so on. Right? So we want to do the same thing for functions which maps R into R. So the expression is F of X plus B is equal to F of X plus gradient of F of X transpose D plus 1 over 2 factorial D transpose okay, plus higher order terms. Okay, so this is the Taylor series for functions that uh, are defined on n variables. You know, unfortunately, this class is very dry because it's all review material, but I'm sure the next class is going to get interesting. Uh, uh, okay. So my, let's say my function f of x is sine of x1, x2 plus cos of x3. So what would my gradient of f b so f is a function from r3 to r so the gradient of f should be a vector in three dimensions so gradient of f of x should be in r3 okay so what is the gradient of the function so it's del f over del x1 del f over del x2 so these are partial derivatives. What this means is when I'm taking differentiation with respect to x1, I'm going to treat x2 and x3 as constant. When I take differentiation with respect to x2, I'm going to treat x1 and x3 as constant and so on. So what is the first derivative of f? I mean the derivative of f with respect to x1, the partial derivative of f with respect to x1. Who wants to give it a shot? Saw you on. Okay, Mary, you want to give it a shot? Yeah. What would be the second term? I want to hear from someone else. What about the gradient with respect to x3? minus sin x3 okay why because x1 x2 is constant so sine of x1 x2 is constant so this the derivative with respect to x3 is equal to 0 so you only have to con consider the cosine of x3 what is uh, so gradient of f of x will be in r3 And the second derivative will be a square matrix of dimension 3. So I now want to compute Oh yeah. Perfect. I was just checking whether all of you are attentive or not. <laughs> okay. 
So at least someone is attending, uh, is looking at the board and thinking. Okay, so now I want to find out the second derivative of the function with respect to x. And this is going to be a symmetric matrix. Okay, that's why we went through this whole ordeal of understanding symmetric matrices. So the gradient, second derivative of f is going to be a symmetric matrix. Okay, so what would go here? Okay, so this would be, let me, uh, let me rename it g1, g2, g3. So I have to write gradient of g1, gradient of g2, and gradient of g3. Okay, so I'm calling this as function g1, calling this as function g2, and calling this as function g3. So the second derivative is going to be gradient of g1, gradient of g2, gradient of g3 stacked together in a square matrix form. So who wants to help me? What would be the first term here? So I have to uh, take the gradient of this with respect to x1, treating x2 and x3 as constant. So that would be plus, no, sine x1, x2, right? What would be the term here? That would be the derivative of G2 with respect to X1. So that would be cosine X1, X2 minus X1 square sine X1, X2. Okay, what about the gradient of G3 with respect to X1? What's that? Zero. Okay, what is going to be, what should I write here? Remember, this is a symmetric matrix, right? This is a symmetric matrix, so I'm just going to write Okay, and I'm going to write zero here, right? That's because zero is on this side. What about derivative of G2 with respect to X2? So G2 with respect to X2 is minus okay. What would be the derivative of G3 with respect to X2? Zero. So this will also be zero because I just have to copy this number here. What is the derivative of G3 with respect to X3? Minus cos X of 3. Okay, so that's my second derivative of f evaluated at x. Okay, and if you want to find out what is f of x plus d for d very small, just go through this Taylor expansion, plug in the value of gradient of f at x and the second derivative of f at x, right? Both the expressions are right here. Multiply it by d here, multiply it by d transpose second derivative d here and you would be very close to the actual answer or actual value of f of x plus d. What is the third term like? Oh, good, good point. What would be the the third derivative of f with respect to x? No, the, but, but the first question is, what is the third derivative of f with respect to x? Yes, it will be a three-dimensional matrix. 
right? It will be a three-dimensional matrix. So if you have two-dimensional matrix, you have D transpose and D and you get a scalar. For a three-dimensional matrix, you have to multiply it by D on all three dimensions. Okay, so that's called uh, tensor. I mean, that goes into this entire theory of tensors. So we don't want to consider it. The reason is we will always be very close to X, right? So D is going to be very small. So we are going to neglect these higher order terms. Okay? And just uh, confine ourselves up to the second derivative of F. It's easier to understand. It's easier to solve problems with that. And we don't have to visualize three-dimensional matrices that we are not used to visualizing on a day-to-day -day basis. But three-dimensional matrices are important. Where is it important? Has any, anyone encountered three-dimensional matrices? MRIs, okay? MRIs are three-dimensional matrix of your entire body or whatever uh, organ you are doing MRI of. So those matrices are three-dimensional. It's huge matrix. And the doctors analyze, e analyze every cross-section of that three-dimensional matrix to figure out if there is a problem with your body or with your brain or whatever. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay, so that's uh, the recap of Taylor series for functions of n variables. Now I want to talk about convex sets. So let's first talk about convex functions. So f is, a, this is a definition convex function if if either if for any alpha in 0 1 f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. No, I don't think I should write it at the beginning. It should go in the end. f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 is less than equal to x2 for all alpha in 0, 1. Okay? So this is if a function satisfies this expression, then it's known as a convex function. And the picture I want you to have in mind is as follows. This is my x. This is my f of x. And a convex function looks like this. And this is my x1, this is my x2, this is my alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2, okay? Okay, so what is f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 here? in this particular graph, it's this value. And what is alpha f of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f of x2 in this graph? Any thoughts? This, this line, this number. Okay, so this is alpha f of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f of x2, okay? So what it's saying is this point always has to be higher than this point, okay? Which is f evaluated at alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2, okay? So that's what is the definition of a convex function. So it always looks like a bowl, 
okay or it looks like a line or a hyperplane so any convex function would look so even this is a convex function let me draw some diagram of convex functions So this is a convex function, okay, and this is a convex function, but what else? This is a convex function, okay, but see, this one is differentiable, this one is differentiable, this one is not differentiable only at this point, okay, but everywhere else it is differentiable. Okay, so the convex function doesn't mean it has to be differentiable. Okay, it could be a non-differentiable convex function. But non-differentiable only at certain points, not everywhere. Um, what is not a, not a convex function? So this is not a convex function. Okay, not a convex function because if you draw a line, it is below the curve, not above the curve. Here if I draw a line, it's above the curve. Here if I draw a line, it is on the curve. Okay, it doesn't have to be above the curve. Remember this is not a strict inequality, it's a less than equal to sign. Okay, it is on the curve. This is on the curve if I draw a line. But here, if I draw a line between any two points on this curve, it is below the curve, so it's not a, it's not a convex function. Now, there are other equivalent definitions of convex function. So the other definition is Okay, so either f of x plus d is greater than or equal to f of x plus gradient of fx transpose d for all x and d. So if that satisfies, then it's a convex function. Or if the second derivative of function is positive semi-definite, then it's a convex function. Okay, and those are all equivalent definition. You don't need differentiability here. You need first if the function f to be first differentiable here. You need the function f to be twice differentiable here. Okay. Any questions on convex functions? You know, I have two minutes and I want to make good use of it. So I will talk about convex sets. Okay. So I'm going to denote a set X in this way. So X in Rn is convex if and only if X1, X2 in X imply alpha X1 plus one minus alpha X2 also lies in X for all alpha in zero one. And what that means is you have a set X sitting in Rn and I pick any two points in this set and I draw a line. That entire line should be contained in X itself. Okay, so then it's a convex set. What is not convex is if I have a set X that looks like this. So if I pick a point here and I pick a point here Okay, and I draw a line, it's not contained in the set itself, right? So this is not convex. Okay, 
So I think I've covered everything that is needed as a background material for this class. So next class on, onward, we will talk about optimization, uh, necessary conditions, sufficient conditions, and so on for unconstrained optimization. If any of you have not got this course information sheet, please collect it from me. And if you have any questions, just come back to me now and we can talk about it.